across the globe by satellite. Join us for Welcome to Grace, where we'll discover together the distinctiveness of Paul's apostleship through the rightly divided word of truth. Now, join pastor and Bible teacher, Kirk Christ, as we explore the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, thank you for joining us once again. Welcome to Grace. Uh, as we continue our look at Paul's letter to Titus, uh, we've already learned that Paul had left um, Titus in Crete to set things in order in the home assemblies on that island. And we know that the Apostle Paul had a great deal of confidence. He had to have placed a great deal of confidence in Titus, uh, given what was going on in Crete. But we know more so that he had his confidence was in Christ to work through Titus to accomplish what Paul wanted to be accomplished there and what God wanted to be accomplished on that island. Uh, so... Um, and that, that was to address two major issues, actually. We need to take a look at those very quickly. Issue number one had to do with doctrinal perversion or doctrinal lies. Uh, issue number two had to do with reprobate lives. So it wasn't just what was being taught. It was how the people there were living their lives and how those false teachers were living their lives as well. And there's an intimation there in Scripture that those false teachers were believers. Uh, so let's, we'll take, be taking a look at that in a moment. Uh, for starters, there was a lot of subversive teaching taking place there on Crete, as seen in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, where Paul wrote, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Uh, Strong's has it mind misleaders, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And remember, they were house churches, so they were subverting the believers there as well as subverting I, be, subverting, I believe, the people on the island. So one of the major issues that Titus would need to address was that of doctrinal heresy, that the people of Crete were, were obviously beginning to buy into. Whole houses were being subverted, Paul said. And Paul linked this doctrinal deception to those of the circumcision. Uh, the indication we get from the text is that this deceptive teaching had been coming from Jewish believers rather than Jewish unbelievers. And we don't know that for certain, but there are some things in here we'll look at. The wording in Paul's letter leads us in that direction. Notice verses 12 and 13. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, Paul affirmed. Uh, Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, Paul's telling Titus, that they may be sound in the faith. In a very real sense, Crete had become Satan's playground. Paul said that the inhabitants were always liars. Well, what did John call Satan? John called Satan the father of lies in John chapter, four verse, uh, or chapter 8, verse 44. The Cretans were evil beasts, uh, Paul stated. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter said, Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a what? Roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's an evil beast, I would say. So the Cretans were described as evil beasts. Peter depicted Satan as an evil beast. The Cretans were slow bellies, Paul stated. Now this one can throw us for a loop. Slow bellies, one commentator put uh, lazy gluttons. But I think there's much more involved, much more included in that if we'll dig a little deeper. The word slow can be thought of in the sense of idle, not working, lazy, but it can also be thought of in the sense of not moving fast, uh, taking one's time, we might say, not in a hurry, taking all the time required and more so in order to accomplish your purpose, moving slow. The word translated belly has to do with gluttony, according to a dictionary of the Greek. The idea is that of an insatiable appetite. That's what comes to my mind. Peter stated that Satan was not only a roaring lion in the sense of an evil beast, but we can also be certain that Satan, the devil, will take all the time in the world, all the time it takes, in his attempt to devour believers. If he can't do it all in one fell swoop, he'll be happy to do it incrementally is, is really the case. As long as he believes, he can ultimately achieve his goal. The word translated devour means ravage, take in destroy, which carries with it the idea of doing damage. Uh, one of the synonyms for that is despoiling, abolishing, or nullifying. 
and nullifying particularly strikes me within this text here. To render ineffective is as good a way to think of it as any. Just as the doctrinal deceivers on Crete were willing to chip away at the people of Crete in order to satisfy their lust for personal gain, filthy lucre, Paul calls it, Satan has an insatiable insatiable appetite when it comes to rendering believers ineffective, to nullifying our message in the, in the minds of others. Uh, so Satan would love to nullify the ministries of believers when it comes to the message of reconciliation in the gospel of Christ. I've often said if Satan can't have your soul, and we know that he can't have the soul of any saved and sealed saint, I believe he'll be totally satisfied with your life here on earth and how you live that life if he can nullify the message you're proclaiming. Uh, he'd love to render every believer's ministry ineffective. And he knows how to use the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life to accomplish his goal. And he does so. In 2 Timothy, another of the pastoral epistles, Paul said, For Demas hath forsaken me. Do you remember anybody remember reading that passage? For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So you see the draw, even on believers, uh, away from truth. Well, who is the God of this world, according to the Apostle Paul? Well, the answer is Satan, Paul tells us. And there's nothing the adversary of God loves more than believers becoming entangled with the affairs of this life, of this world, Paul tells us. Another statement from Paul found in one of the other pastoral epistles, 2 Timothy. In order to nullify any ministry that person might have had for Christ, Satan attacks the credibility of the message first, if we use Paul as our pattern. And secondly, he attacks the credibility of the messenger as he uses God's people. Isn't it amazing that God uses his people to accomplish his purpose? And Satan uses God's people <laughs> to accomplish his purpose. Um, so he was certainly using the deceivers, possibly Jewish believers, as we noted, to accomplish his goal with the people of Crete who were falling for their deceptive message. We get the idea from Paul's statement, Titus chapter 1, verse 13, where Paul directs Titus to rebuke the deceivers sharply. Now here it is, that they may be sound in the faith, meaning doctrinally, behaviorally healthy. Um, Paul wanted that, but these believers, if they were Jewish believers indeed, were definitely not doctrinally and behaviorally healthy, which Paul is addressing. Um, that these deceivers had possibly been believers to the gospel of God, but they had become more concerned with en enriching themselves financially than remaining true to the faith doctrinally and behaviorally. Paul said, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, meaning grown up, mature in belief and in behavior. Uh, the idea being that their practice might match their profession. You've all heard the expression, we, we talk the talk, we should walk the walk. Uh, well, sometimes that's used to try to prove somebody isn't saved. I totally reject that notion. Um, but we should. Uh, if, we're, if we're talking about grace and we're talking about what Christ has accomplished for us, his agape on our behalf, then we should certainly practice agape on the behalf of others. Uh, so Paul tells us in verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. That word reprobate is the opposite of show yourself to be approved, it's unapproved. Uh, the performance of these Jewish deceivers was belying their profession. Uh, what was the doctrinal heresy, we might ask, that they had been spreading around there on Crete? If we look back at Paul's very first epistle, uh, we know that certain Judaizers had come from the assembly of Gal in, in Galatia, come to the assemblies in Galatia, teaching that circumcision is a requirement for the Gentiles to be saved. We know that was a lie. We know that this false teaching was having an effect on Paul's converts to the gospel of Christ in Asia because of Paul's words in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, to those very believers who were being subverted. Notice what Paul said, I marvel, I'm surprised, it astonishes me that you folks are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God, Christ unto another gospel. Now, don't get tripped up and think they were so soon removed from Christ. They weren't. They were part and parcel of Christ. They were joined to Christ. They couldn't get out of Christ. As we said, the Holy Spirit who was indwelling them, they sealed them. He was the seal. He could grieve. He couldn't leave. But here, they were removing themselves from the truth of what Paul had taught them and moving away into falsehood. They were... They were not reverting back into sin. They were reverting back into law, uh, which is not another gospel, Paul said, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So there we have it. Not only had those Judaizers in Galatia been mixing law with grace, 
They were insisting that some of the traditions that the Jews had developed themselves, traditions they came up with on their own, be observed as well. Uh, so Paul called those traditions Jewish fables and commandments of men in his letter to Titus. Paul knew the effect, conscience-wise, conscience uh, those perverse doctrines would have on the people of Crete because perverse doctrines were capable of defiling their consciences. Uh, notice his words in chapter 1, uh, verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So we see what was happening to the conscience of folks in Greece, in, on Crete, and especially maybe in those home churches. Now don't misunderstand what Paul's saying here. He wasn't stating that everything is proper for grace believers to indulge in as they attempt to satisfy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, immorality is clearly not pure. We know that. This statement is a perfect example of the necessity of keeping something within, written in the Bible within the context in which that was written. The context of verse 14 was the Jewish fables and the man-made commandments that the Judaizers had been insisting upon. Traditions of men that had been nothing at all, had nothing at all to do with the law contract. They were just simply traditions. Uh, the Judaizers say, were saying, touch not taste not, in connection with things that had never been taboo under the law of Moses in the first place. Uh, those man-made legalistic traditions had become so ingrained in the minds of the, of the consciences of those folks that uh, their consciences were defiled uh, if they failed to observe the things that were never given them to observe in Scripture in the first place, they, their consciences were negative or uh, attacking them when they didn't do what they thought they were supposed to do. Those traditions of the Judaizers had become a law unto themselves. And those legalistic traditions were being promoted in connection with righteousness before God in Crete. Any of that going on today in the world of religion? Traditions being promoted as though these are absolutes. And if you don't do them, you begin to feel guilty. Well, I didn't do what I thought I should be doing, or we didn't do what we, I thought we should be doing. Let me give you a hypothetical modern day example uh, of what I'm talking about. What if I were to go around telling fellow churchgoers, let's say, that if they eat in the so-called, what would this be called in a lot of, in a lot of areas? Sanctuary. <laughs> if I eat in the so-called sanctuary, if I tell people they're defiling the house of the Lord by doing that, uh, thinking all the while that because I don't eat in the so-called sanctuary, I'm spiritually superior uh, to those who do. And at the same time that I'm insisting upon that rule for others, I'm prone to fly into fits of rage from time to time and uh, things don't go my way and think nothing of getting stone cold drunk on, on the weekends and chasing after every skirt that catches my eye. You see what happens there? It's hypocrisy. It's nothing more than hypocrisy. There's an inconsistency there and I think we can all see it. Christ called that kind of thinking in his day hypocrisy. It's no less hypocrisy in ours. What if I teach the grace of God on one hand and yet live like the devil on the other? What if I teach that stealing is a sin and yet I'm a gossip? Uh, or that smoking is an abomination before the Lord while lying when I deem it appropriate and necessary, uh, believing, that, believing that that's an acceptable practice. We could go on and on, could we not? Uh, we're always able to point the finger. The human pride nature is quick to point out the failures of others while ignoring, denying, and even justifying the failures in ourselves. You're blameworthy, I'm blameless, is how the pride nature looks at it. What pious hypocrisy that is, that's pharisaical dishonesty. And that's what was happening with the Judaizers. The truth is, if we on, be honest with ourselves, when we point the finger at somebody else, how many are pointing back at us? At least three are pointing right back at ourselves. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 2, verse 1 where our apostle stated this, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest do the same things. Uh, to proclaim grace as though we've arrived with all our great doctrinal knowledge and understanding, while at the same time living ungracious lives, is a testimonial inconsistency. It doesn't mean that a person is unsaved. It simply proves that the flesh is full of hypocrisy. Uh, I'll, if I proclaim the unlimited and unmerited, unmerited love, past tense, all-inclusive forgiveness of God as part of my message, but I'm unforgiving, 
and I'm unloving when it comes to those who've offended me, uh, how much validity should I expect others to have toward the message that I'm proclaiming? Uh, you folks know what we're talking about here. And this was going on in Crete, big time. The Judaizers on Crete were insisting that the people of Crete follow their perverse doctrines for righteousness before God, and all the while, they were living ungodly lives themselves. They professed that they knew God, but their lives didn't match what they were saying with their lips. Um, they were abominable and disobedient and unto every good work unapproved or reprobate, Paul said. What application can we make when it comes to those who serve in assemblies today? Uh, Paul's telling us that our lives should be consistent with our lips or others, um, others will not give any, listen, they, they'll use our lives. Others will use our lives as justification to resist our grace proclamation. This is, this is why the Apostle Paul gave instruction to Titus as to the criteria that he was to use when it came to appointing elders for the office of bishop, overseer, on the island of Crete. Let's begin our look at the benchmark that Paul set uh, for Titus to appoint elders in the outcalling. Paul begins his listing with verse 6. We're only going to look at the first two today because I think those first two are are totally uh, misconstrued in a lot of instances, but we'll take a look at it, at least in my opinion. If any be blameless, that's number one. The husband of one wife, that's number two. Having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. Interesting word, that word riot, it means overindulgence. Um, let's just take them one at a time. As you can see, Paul began with, if any be blameless. Now here we must ask, blameless in what respect? Uh, it's important to keep Paul's words within the context of the passage, or, or we can come out with a totally false narrative, and I'll show you that this morning. Let me show you what I'm talking about by pointing to the life of a famous biblical self-proclaimed elder. Here it is in the Bible. None other than the apostle Peter. Uh, would anyone deny that Peter was qualified elder? He said, I'm an elder. Did he... Should he have been qualified? Do you think he would have been an elder if he wasn't qualified to be an elder? Or do you think he was qualified to be an elder? I would say he was qualified to be an elder. Why? Because he gives that testimony first about himself, but it was the Holy Spirit who inspired him to write what he did when he called himself an elder. Uh, so here are Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you, among who? The Jews of the dispersion. I exhort who am also an elder, there it is, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What glory was Peter referring to, we might ask, just to slip this in. I believe it's the same glory that the Apostle Paul stated shall be revealed in all believers in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. But back to the point at hand regarding an elder being blameless. Did the Apostle Peter call himself an elder? Well, you've just read it, did you not? Uh, and more importantly, the Holy Spirit, as I said a minute ago, also called Peter an elder because the Holy Spirit was the inspiring agent behind what Peter wrote. This tells us that God himself proclaimed Peter to have been an elder. Now, you Bible scholar, scholars probably already know where I'm going with this, don't you? Uh, had Peter been blameless? Well, let's take a quick look. After what is often called the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, Christ told Peter that he would deny him three times before that evening came to a close. Christ's words and Peter's response are recorded in Mark chapter 14, verses 30 and 31. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me three times. But he, Peter, spake the more vehemently. This guy's getting... Up in arms here. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. Every one of them said the same thing. What did Peter do? We all know, don't we? He denied Christ three times. Um, and so when it came to denying the one that Peter vehemently stated he would not deny, had Peter been blameless? Or had he, was he to be blamed? When Christ took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane prior to his arrest, he gave them a, a command. And that command was to tarry and to watch while he went off by himself a distance further to pray alone. Uh, what did he find the disciples, including Elder Peter, doing when he returned from his private time of prayer? You folks that study your Bibles already know the answer. Here it is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 40. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them, keyword, asleep, and said unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Was Peter 
to be blamed? Was Peter blameworthy there, or was he blameless? Uh, would you say that Peter had been blameless when it came to following Christ's instructions on that, on that fateful night? The answer is obviously not. Now, some would make the case that Peter had not been an elder at that point in time. He was yet to get his eldership. Uh, that eldership would come later for the apostle Peter. So the question is, did Peter become blameless after his denial of Christ and after his fatigue got the best of him there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Uh, for those, for those who, who may be uncertain, let's take a quick look at what Paul had to say about Peter in connection with Peter refusing to eat with the Gentiles. And, and I know some of you thought I, I was going there and that's exactly where I went. Uh, Peter, some... I guess some had come from James and told them about circumcision. Then Peter visited that assembly. Those assemblies, however many there happened to be there in Galatia. But on that one uh, occasion, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. He was eating with the Gentiles, sitting with the Gentiles prior to that because he knew full well Paul's gospel, that they were one now. But then when the circumcision saints started coming around, uh, what did Peter do? Well, here it is in Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 11. He refused to eat because he didn't want those seeing him that he had been a part of, he didn't want them seeing him, he would have been embarrassed to sit with the Gentiles. But notice his blameworthiness or his blamelessness in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because Peter the elder was what? To be blamed. But an elder is supposed to be blameless, is he not? Paul hadn't confronted Peter in a false manner, Peter was indeed to be blamed because Peter had been blameworthy. Else the Holy Spirit would not have inspired the Apostle Paul to write that Peter was to be blamed. You see what can happen when we take a verse out of its context, such as Paul telling Titus that those Titus was to appoint to be elder bishops must be blameless. Keeping Paul's direction to Titus within the context, we read further to discover the areas where Paul told Titus that he was to uh, appoint elder bishops and those elder bishops were to be blameless. Return with me to Titus chapter 1, verse 6 once again. If any be blameless, in what areas, Paul? Are you talking overall in every single thing or in what areas? Paul says, the husband of one wife. Now stop there for a moment. Having faithful children, not accused of, of uh, riot or unruly. This next statement from the Apostle Paul is where a lot of confusion, I believe, and misteaching, uh, that if a man has ever been divorced in his life, that man can never qualify as an elder bishop. So we need to look at that more closely, don't we? We need to examine that. Therefore, once divorced, a person can never serve as a pastor teacher because every pastor teacher is to be an elder. How do we know that that type of teaching is totally false and not what Paul's saying at all? The answer is for two reasons, and the Bible's going to give us both. First of all, Paul wasn't talking about the past life or the past experience of an individual, the, the individuals that Titus was to appoint. He was talking about the present character of the person's life at the time that Titus was to appoint him. And the Bible will bear that out. I'll show you that in a little bit. Secondly, the husband of one wife is not speaking about divorce at all, which we'll also see in Scripture, as well as uh, the Bible is going to tell us what the husband of one wife is actually talking about. How do we know that Paul wasn't talking about a person's past experience, but about that person's present character, that which characterized that person's life at that point in his life? Let me give you several reasons. Reason number one, each statement in Paul's listing in verses 6 through 9 was made in the present tense, not in the past tense. It wasn't made in the tense of something happening and continuing on through that person's life. It was made in the present tense. Paul goes on to say, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not given to filthy lucre, a lover of hospitality, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Every statement sitting in, in the text there is about the present disposition of the person that Titus was to appoint. His character, that which characterized his life at that time, not the past experience of that person. If it was the past experience of that person, nobody who was given to wine could ever be an elder at any point. And so, and there's more reasons than that, but we'll go through them. It should be obvious that every one of Paul's statements is in the present tense, that which was happening uh, 
at the time, that which characterized that person's life at the time he was to be appointed an elder. In verse 9, for instance, Paul described those Titus was to appoint as elders, uh, as being those who were at that time holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. Would that be something that would necessarily have characterized those believers' lives when they had first come to hear the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ? that they would have been those holding fast to everything that they had heard, or did they have to grow? Would those people that, were, that came to, to Christ have to grow in the faith, have to grow in what they were learning about behavior and consistency in their lives? A believer would have to be taught something in, in order to hold fast when it come, came to the teaching. He had been taught, wouldn't he? Uh, Paul's listing isn't about how things had been for those folks. Titus was to a point there, but about that which had become the character of their lives of those saints' lives at the time that Titus was to point them. Paul himself had not been blameless, as he's going to point out. Peter had not been blameless. Uh, Paul said, according to the law, I'm blameless. But what did they know about the inside of Paul? Paul knew more about his inside than they knew about his inside. Not self-willed, meaning self-pleasing, according to a dictionary of the Greek. Is there anybody here that would say, I'm not self-willed at all? Not about my way, ever. How many would qualify for elder bishop in that regard? There's not a qualified person in this room nor any other that I know of that met that criteria when they first came to belief anyway. Um, hopefully that's something that every believer should be growing towards, striving for, but it's not something that characterizes every believer's life. Paul wasn't talking about past condition. He was talking about the present disposition of the people that, that Titus was to point. Not having unruly children. Now think about that one for a moment. Not having unruly children. The word translated unruly, literally, according to a dictionary of the Greek language, means disobedient. Not having disobedient children. Does that mean that if a child of a person had ever been disobedient at any point in his life, the father of that child could never qualify for the position of elder bishop in an assembly? Reason these things through, folks, the answer is obviously no. That's a ridiculous notion. It's about the corrective steps that father of that disobedient child will be taking to bring about disobedience um, where his at-home children are concerned. Uh, which brings up another point I believe is worth adding here, and we're going to jump off track to jump to number two, uh, not having unruly and, uh, and disobedient children. Because I think it's the most important point, especially in light of all the child abuse that's taking place today. You, I don't need to tell you. You can listen to the news, you can read your newspapers, you know that there's massive child abuse taking place today. And um, so let's take a look at that for a moment. Proper discipline. Now I'm giving you my ver. This is not uh, ex cathedra. This is Kurt's version. Uh, we will use some Bible verses in here, but just listen for a moment. Proper discipline, in my opinion, is never, never about beating your children into submission. Um, I know that's not going to come into group. Everybody's not going to be in agreement with what I said there. Um, but, and it's not my purpose to meddle into anybody's, uh, especially grace believers' lives when it comes to the discipline of their children. But I want to give you my personal opinion anyway, especially in light of the fact that Paul mentions children not accused of riot or disobedient in connection with the qualifications of elders. And in, in, in view of my own past errors, I could say, the method that parents use for discipline is a highly personal matter with each set of parents having their own views. But if I could do it all over again, speaking personally, I'd, I'd resort to a different approach than the one I took earlier on. Uh, I had heard it said over and over again, spare the rod, spoil the child. Is that in the Bible? That's not even to be found in the Bible. It's really not. Spare the rod, spoil the child is a proverb, but it's not. It might surprise you to know that that expression is not found anywhere in the Bible. It actually came from a guy named Samuel Butler in a 1662 poem. Of course, Samuel Butler wrote that poem based on Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, which states, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. It's been suggested, and not without merit, that the expression spareth his rod is used in a figurative sense to mean spareth his son the corrective discipline that son needs, rather than a literal rod. I guess the question would be this, what's the meaning of the word rod in Scripture uh, as it's used there in the Bible? And what was its purpose? What was the purpose of the rod? Let's look at it more closely. 
was the word rod being used figuratively in the book of Proverbs to stand for chastisement, corrective chastisement, meaning well-explained boundaries, perfectly understood ahead of time boundaries with suitable consequences, administered lovingly and consistently, that's a key word today, as child training. Or was the writer using the word literally as speaking of an actual rod? And if so, what type of rod did the writer have in mind? Keep in mind that he didn't say paddle. He said rod, didn't he? There's a difference. Technically speaking, a, a, a piece of iron rebar would be a rod in a technical sense. A metal baseball bat might also be considered to be a rod. Or a metal shovel handle, for that matter, matter could be considered a rod. So who determines what rod they're to use? If the word rod was being used literally rather than figuratively, is it up to each parent to decide what type of rod to be used? But it must be a rod. Should parents actually go out and buy a wooden dowel, uh, a wooden dowel rod or some similar such device to use on their children as a form of discipline? As one religious author advocates should be done today, get yourself a rod. And so a lot of parents use a dowel rod. I think it's ridiculous. And I think they're instilling something in that child they don't know they're instilling in that child. And what size dowel rod should be, should be used on our children? Should we get the large dowel rod or should we get the little dowel rod? What, what size? Is that just up to each parent? Or could the author of Proverbs been speaking figur figuratively? Do we ever see the word rod used in Scripture in a figurative sense? In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 15, for instance, speaking of Jesus Christ, during the time of his millennial reign on earth, we see this statement about Christ using something. Let's look. And out of his Christ's mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it, that sword, he should smite the nations. An actual sword is to come out of the mouth of Christ? Or was the word sword being used in a figurative sense in that passage? Judgment he was going to speak forth. That's portrayed as the sword in a figurative sense. And he, Christ, shall rule them with, here it is, a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That takes us back to the idea of a rod, iron rebar, does it not? Christ is going to actually get out of the hardware store in the millennial reign, buy himself a large piece of iron rebar, and he's going to rule the nations with that rod of iron rebar. Um, if you're going to use the word rod literally... And every time you see the word rod in Scripture, you'd have to say that parents would be obligated. They'd be obliged to use a rod of iron to discipline their children because that's what Christ is going to do. And then what are we going to do with a passage such as Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4? We're speaking of Christ again. The prophet wrote these words. But with righteousness shall he, Christ Jesus again, judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with, catch this, the rod of his mouth... Figuratively or literally? The rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. It's obvious, folks, that the expression, the rod of his mouth, the word rod there is being used figuratively. Uh, another example of a rod in Scripture is found in the famous 23rd Psalm. How many remember that? I know you could quote it by heart. Um, I know we're all, all familiar with that. Listen to the words as I speak them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now we come to the infamous verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Sound like they're getting a, a lashing with a piece of iron rebar? Now think about the imagery presented in the words of that verse, thy rod and thy staff comforteth me. Because I'll show you something else here I think we often miss. The image is that of the shepherd's staff, the shepherd's scepter. Uh, let me show it to you. Notice what Christ called himself in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Christ likened his relationship with the people of Israel to that of a shepherd and his sheep, also to a father and his children. They were called the children of God. The shepherds of Christ's day carried a staff, also called a crook, uh, sometimes called a scepter. Notice what that staff is called in Micah, Micah chapter 7, verse 14. Feed thy people with what? Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage with 
dwell solitarily in the wood in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. Perhaps this is why Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English Language tells us that the word rod, when used in Scripture, is a reference to the shepherd's rod, the rod of the 23rd Psalm. The shepherd was never without his rod, we're told. He carried it with him whenever he went, whenever he was tending his sheep and wherever he was tending them. The shepherd didn't drive his sheep. He walked in front of the sheep. He led the sheep. They simply followed his example. But if you know anything about sheep, you know that sheep have a tendency to follow other sheep, do they not? Now liken it to children. Isn't that true? And following other sheep could lead to trouble. Um, when that occurred, the shepherd could use his rod to gently guide them back on course. Uh, the purpose of the crook at the end of the shepherd's rod was for pulling that stray sheep back onto the right path. But one thing we're told by those in the know, the shepherd never used his rod to strike, to beat any of his sheep. That would have been totally counterproductive, we're told by people who know about tending sheep. However, the shepherd could use his rod as a, a weapon. He could use it for striking. He could use it for, as a weapon to inflict harm, but never on a sheep. He could strike an animal enemy to his sheep uh, with his rod. He could protect his sheep in that manner. But the shepherd never used his rod to strike his sheep. Does the 23rd Psalm not stand out more clearly with that definition of rod in mind? They comfort me. Look at Psalms 23, 1 through 3, and we'll read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The shepherd led. He never drove. He didn't drive. He would guide, but he, but he, didn't, he didn't goad, so to speak. He would corral, but he, he, he never chided uh, with the sheep. Could you imagine a shepherd standing there and screaming at his sheep? Threatening his sheep with bodily harm if they didn't obey him. What good would that possibly do where sheep are concerned? Could you imagine a shepherd standing before his sheep and saying, That's one. <laughs> oh, there's two. <laughs> Three's coming. What does that teach a child? To push the envelope. That child automatically knows he can go to three. As long as he stops just shy of three, <laughs> he's okay. Could you imagine a shepherd beating his sheep into compliance. I can't. The shepherd led his sheep to where they could find food and rest. He kept them from going in the wrong direction, but he never used his rod to strike his sheep. You won't find an example of that. He could keep them from going in the wrong direction without beating them. The verse in 1 Peter that we talked about in our previous lesson in connection with elders stands out to me here. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, which some of you will recall, neither as being lords over God's heritage but being in samples to the flock. Now, the flock happens to be the people the pastor-teacher is teaching. Should I bring a rod on Sunday mornings, a piece of iron rebar, and if you don't get it and you don't decide, you don't agree, you're going to go your own way, should I start beating people or striking them with rods? Um, we know that the word rod can be used in Scripture in a figurative sense to picture the rebuke or the reproof called admonishment. Um, for the purpose of dressing down, as it might be called today, when it comes to child training. A good example of that is found in both the Old Testament as well as in an epistle from Paul. Let me show you both. Compare Micah chapter 6, verse 9, with 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, figuratively or generally, uh, or, or literally. Um, can you hear a piece of iron rebar for that matter, or a dowel rod? Uh, hear ye the rod, hear ye the corrective voice of God, and who hath appointed it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21, the Apostle Paul wrote this to the carnal saints in Corinth, and I know you recall this verse. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Should he come chastising them, rebuking them, telling them what is, or should he go to the hardware store and buy a dowel rod or whatever, and bring a rod to them and actually begin striking them? Paul had no intention of carrying a wooden stick, much less an iron bar, into the, into the carnal assemblies of Corinth. Nor did he have in mind a twig from a tree that he was going to use on them, a baseball bat or a wooden dowel, uh, dowel rod. But Paul knew how to take those carnal saints in Corinth to task. 
for their untoward behavior. And he knew how to do so in a manner that wouldn't defeat them, wouldn't instill anger in them, wouldn't cause them to give up or drive them to rue the day that he had ever become their apostle. It's been said that corporal punishment is not about breaking the child's spirit, but it's about breaking the child's will. Um, but there can be a very thin line between the will and the spirit, and how many parents actually know where that is? And every child's different. Every child requires something different. The problem is that far too often when hitting a child is a co chosen course of action, that hitting doesn't occur until something swells up in the mind of the, the one who's delivering the punishment. And what would that be? Well, frustration at the very least with what's happening. Uh, anger often enters the equation. And children have a tendency to associate a parent's venom, whether a frustrated parent thinks he's projecting his frustration or not, with their value. I can tell you that firsthand. It doesn't have to be an injustice on the part of the parent. It can be per a perceived injustice on the part of the one on the receiving end of the hitting. And perceived injustice cultivates anger in the one perceiving it, an anger that may not be expressed openly, but an anger that's seething under the surface, building gradually nonetheless, and it builds over time. If the Apostle Paul had, had not been concerned about the fine line between breaking a child's spirit and breaking a child's will, he would not have written Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Paul never needed to hit those he was child training. Isn't that amazing? Paul was able to set boundaries with his words, he could speak the truth in love such that they'd hear the rod of his mouth, as he used that expression. And his correction never came apart from encouragement, ever. Paul never had to beat the flock he was tending at that time physically in order to get them to perform behaviorally. Um, as any good shepherd would do, Paul made the boundaries he set for them very clear, and he did insist that those boundaries be honored. Yelling and screaming isn't about setting a boundary and requiring that boundary be honored lest consequences commensurate with the disobedience be put into play, um, which can be done apart from hitting the offender at all. The key is to set clear-cut and properly understood in advance boundaries and then to apply the consequences, logical consequences, resulting from defying those boundaries and apply them in a consistent manner. Logical consequences followed through Lovingly and consistently, I believe, is the greatest teacher when it comes to children. I wish I had known that earlier in my life with my own children. But that requires time, doesn't it? Whoa, that requires some time to be taken with these kids. And who has the time? A lot of parents would ask to do this. That's a huge part of the problem today. It's much easier to beat than to be an example and teach. And it takes far less time to beat, does it not? Let's just get it over with. We'll go into the room, you'll take your wax, we'll get it over with, and we can each go on our own way, the problem's resolved. And I would say, really? Do we know the problem's been resolved? The problem may be resolved in the mind of the one delivering the physical discipline, but it may not be resolved in the mind of the child who's on the receiving end of being struck by a parent. According to social scientists, what children need most from their parents in this usually means fathers, is time. They most need time. The expression, time is of the essence, is so true today. Uh, while shepherds never physically struck their flocks, we know that, it doesn't appear that a shepherd left his flock alone for any length of time. Th think back to Christ and the 12 disciples, his children in a very real sense. They learned from him how. They learned from him by hanging out with him during the entire time of his earthly ministry. They followed him. They talked with him all along the way. They ate with him. They traveled with him. And that enabled him, them to learn from him by following his example. Christ taught them. There isn't a single instance of his striking even one of his disciples. Um, he was molding them that entire time and correcting them along the way, but that required his time time he was willing to give them because they were his children, according to him. And he was a good shepherd, as he stated. I don't want to go too far off track here or meddle in the affairs of parents, but when Paul talked about the qualifications of elders, 
He wasn't talking about the past lives of those men and how they did things in the past or their children. He was talking about that which had become the character of their lives as they had grown in grace when it had come time for, there to be a, there, for those folks to be appointed as elder overseers. The verb tense with every cri criteria Paul set is the present indicative active. Now that might not mean much if you're not into the Greek language and the grammar there, but every single statement he made is in the present indicative active, which a book on Greek grammar defines this way. Let me read it to you. The present indicative active asserts something which is occurring while the speaker is making the statement. He's not going back in their lives and saying, oh, if this was ever your case, you can't be an elder. That's not the case here at all. Peter, as we saw earlier, was an elder, yet there was a time in Peter's life as a believer when he was not uh, blameless, as Scripture reveals. Yet Peter was blameless when it came to the criteria Paul set for eldership and the character of Peter's life at the time. Do you suppose that the Apostle Paul would have been considered an elder? How many would say Paul had to be an elder? If Peter was an elder, Paul had to certainly be no less. Paul was definitely an elder. Was there a time in Paul's life when he would not have been considered blameless? Paul provides that information for us right here in his letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers or different kinds of lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and, and hating one another. There was a time in Paul's life when he would not have qualified for an el as an elder, but there was a time in Paul's life when he would have. God didn't clean up the old Paul, Christianize the flesh so that Paul could become a qualified elder. He crucified the old man, and, and Paul became a new creation in Christ. And even with his new creation status, from God's perspective, Paul stated that in my flesh dwelleth how many good things? No good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not, Romans chapter 7. He said, O wretched man that I used to be, O wretched man that I am. But he qualified in the areas for an eldership, the areas that Paul gave Titus to use. Paul considered himself to be blameless outwardly as far as the law of Moses was concerned, Philippians 3, 6. But Paul knew himself better than anyone else aside from God, knew Paul inwardly. God knew Paul intimately, both inwardly and outwardly. And God and Paul both knew that inwardly speaking, Paul was anything but blameless. Uh, however, Paul didn't have riotous, none really children, did he? <laughs> Else he would have had to have been taking corrective measures, corrective steps uh, to set things in order in his home. And he would also have met the criteria when it came to being the husband of one wife. And it's not what you think it is. I'll explain that. Some have looked at Titus chapter 1, verse 6. Let me show you some of the views that have come out of this, where Paul said, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. And suppose that in order to qualify as an elder... A man had to have a wife because it says the husband of one wife. In other words, the man couldn't be single and be an elder. He had to be married if he was going to be an elder. Uh, to be single would disqualify him to be an elder. The verb tense in that statement is being the husband of one wife. So they say that Titus was only to look for married men to appoint as elders. If somebody was unmarried, couldn't appoint them as an elder. In other words, to be single prohibited being an elder. You see where some have taken it? Uh, well, we know that interpretation of Titus 1.6 to be incorrect because Paul tells us that during the time he wrote his first letter to the outcalling of Corinth as an elder, he was a single man. Now, here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. And he's talking about in a single status. If we say that being single prohibited eldership, we have to go on to say that they have to have children as well because didn't Paul go right there? Having children, <laughs> unruly, uh, not accused, not riotous and unruly, having faithful children. We know that having to be married with children was not a criterion for eldership because Paul was a single man, no evidence that he ever had any children. The question often comes up, did Paul have a wife at one time? and then lost that wife due to some illness or tragedy. Uh, we can't find any of that in Scripture. We're only told that Paul was an apostle and that Paul was single. Had Paul been married, the common supposition continues, he certainly could not have divorced that wife or remarried after the loss of that wife, unless it was a proper remarriage, else Paul could never have met the qualifications of an elder. Eldership requires one life over one lifetime is the common supposition. However... This is where the religious world is willing to make an exception. Uh, if a man's wife dies, they would say, then that man would be free to marry another and still meet the qualifications of an elder. 
Where would that idea come from? Well, it comes straight from Paul's reference to the law of Moses in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Let's take a quick look. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that what? Know the law. How that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, although she be married to another man. And we know uh, from, from the teaching of the Old Testament, Leviticus, Deuteronomy rather, that if, if a woman was unfaithful, the husband was to write her a bill of divorce, put it in her hand, put her out of his house, and the both of them could go remarry. And it was perfectly legal according to the law. The key here is Paul's opening statement that he was speaking to those who knew the law. By the way, Proverbs was written during that time of the law, meaning the law of Moses. And interestingly enough, you might also note that Paul included nothing about the man at all in that passage. It's always about the woman. Have you ever spotted that? It's why didn't he tell the men what they could do and what they couldn't do here? It's only about the woman's freedom from the law of her husband after the husband's death. Of course, a man was responsible to provide for his wife as long as she was alive and the marriage was intact. Uh, this brings us to a third presumption where marriage and meeting the qualifications of an elder are concerned. This one has to do with the issue of divorce. Uh, for most of religiondom, this is the unpardonable sin where serving as an elder in an eldership role in a church is concerned. You've probably heard it said, no man who has ever been divorced is qualified to be a pastor of an assembly. That's a totally false presumption and a misunderstanding of Paul's criteria for being elder. An elder in Titus chapter 1 verse 6, and for more than one reason. First of all, the law of Moses itself allowed for divorce where the betrayal of a marriage relationship had occurred. What did God do where his wife, Israel, and she's called his wife. He was a faithful husband. She was an unfaithful wife. So what did he do where Israel was concerned? Well, he wrote her a bill of divorcement, as seen in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, put her out of his house. Christ, then God could never have been an elder or a teacher because he had been divorced from the wife of, his, uh, of her youth. Christ himself had allowed for divorce in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Fornication, the betrayal of a marriage relationship, made divorce permissible as Christ himself said it. According to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, uh, and God did the same thing with Israel. Here's another question. If a man married a woman who had previously been divorced, for whatever reason, would that man qualify for eldership? Do you see the quagmire we can get ourselves into when we accept the presumed meaning of the husband of one wife? It becomes a very subjective matter, and you can see there each situation would have to be considered on its own merits, would it not? Uh, but a blanket statement that if man has ever been divorced, that man can never qualify for an elder bishop role, he can never be a qualified pastor teacher, proves a total misunderstanding in this pastor's view of the criteria Paul was presenting, and we'll go on to see it. The expression, the husband of one wife, has nothing to do with having been married at the time of eldership, as we saw. It also has nothing to do with remarriage after the death of a spouse, as we would also agree, or with divorce, or with being married to a divorcee. Uh, then what was Paul talking about when he said the husband of one wife? Let's examine the passage more thoroughly. Was it about polygamy? Uh, a man not having more than one wife at a time, such was a common with the patriarchs of Israel. Uh, our minds go to David and Solomon, who each had more than one wife, and concubines on top of the wives. Was Paul prohibiting polygamy in his criteria for eldership during the economy of grace? Well, I believe that would be definitely included in Paul's statement, the husband and one wife, and perhaps it's the direct idea that Paul had him. I don't believe that's the sole factor in his statement, the husband of one wife. There's a broader sense in which we might look at the statement, the husband of one wife. Let's examine that statement more closely by returning to the original language in which God's word was recorded. I believe this may help clear up some of the confusion at least. The word translated husband is the Greek an heir, simply meaning a man. That's it. A man, according to a dictionary of the Greek language, and translated that way at least 150 times in the Greek portion of the Bible. The word translated wife is the Greek 
gune, which the Greek dictionary defines as a woman. While a man may be a husband and a woman may be a wife, a man is a man without being married, and a woman is a woman even if single. Now look at Paul's statement in that light for a moment. A man of one woman, a one woman man. Uh, not a womanizer, a one woman man. I believe that's what Paul has in mind. And I've now come across numerous pastors who believe the same thing. Not a man with a wandering eye. Not a man with a wandering eye. A man who is after, in a manner of speaking, every woman who catches his eye would definitely not qualify for eldership in assembly. In assembly. Whatever the number, there are far too many um, married pastors in our day who run away with a woman, often a married woman, in the same assembly. Uh, they've met during their pastorate. It happens across denominational lines, and yes, indeed, it happens in assemblies that consider themselves to be grace assemblies. I've witnessed it. I've seen it. I've come across it more than once. And even in one instance, it can destroy the testimony of the belief system of that assembly, if not the assembly of, of itself, and it can destroy the people involved. Paul wasn't talking about a past experience, nor was he talking about that which may have characterized a person's life prior to coming to an understanding and belief of the gospel of Christ. As will become even more clear as we travel through the remainder of his elder role qualifications, Paul was talking about that which characterized the person's life at the time Titus was to designate that person to be an elder overseer, elder bishop. So we're going to stop there for today. We're going to pick it up because we've got more criteria to go through before we finish Titus. We'll just finish through his criteria. It's the main purpose of a three-chapter uh, letter that Paul wrote. And we're going to see what the other qualifications are all about. But those are the two main sticking points when it comes to, to choosing pastor elders of a church. And we are all growing in grace. Every one of us are growing in grace. And hopefully as we grow in grace, our lives change along the way. But not every person's life is changed on the spot. It takes time as people grow in the Word. I've learned so much as I've pastored over the years about how I uh, responded where my own children were concerned. And I can tell you that there's no shortage of anger in our youth today. No shortage of anger. Why? What put that anger there? What put those feelings of unworthiness and um, as they matched perhaps their discipline when they were young uh, with who they are as a person? and who Christ sees them. Uh, we'll go on uh, and go through the rest of them. And I know not everybody's going to agree with me on this because we tend to be very legalistic when we want to appoint somebody or choose somebody to be an elder. We revert back to law, do we not? Where do we go for our criteria in our minds? Back to the law of Moses. And back to the law of Moses, caning was permissible. Striking was permissible back under the law of Moses. Forty stripes were allowed. And you'll find the people that adhere to the law today still use caning. And it doesn't matter whether you're a woman, whether you're a child, whether you're a man, you're going to get to Cain. Paul received the rod himself, he said. So we need to see what, what it's all about there. And in my opinion, anyway, uh, I think we do a disjustice to our children when we don't spend the proper time with them. That's needed to teach them, nourish them in the, in the right way. Uh, bring them up in the right way so they won't depart from it. Um, and we've got a lot of people running away from the professing church today. Thank you for joining with us in your endeavor to discover the truths in God's Word. Pastor and teacher Kirk Christ and the entire fellowship of Welcome to Grace Ministries would like to thank you for your support of this ministry of grace. If you're enjoying the teachings and want to share with others, please write us at Welcome to Grace Ministries, P.O. Box 90, Penrose, North Carolina, 28766. You may call us toll free at 877-770-7098 or visit us on the web at www.welcometograce.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you.